Hey everybody, welcome back to the Podcast Daily. It is Tuesday, it is January 31st, and that is Bill Landis and I am Austin Ward. And as promised, we are going to keep diving into Ohio State position previews as spring football creeps ever closer. I think Bill was counting business days. And what did you, you're at 24 <laughs> business days until the start of spring yeah. practice? Yeah, it's five, it's five weeks from today, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just it makes it seem even closer if you just chop off the weekend like I that's love right that. yeah chop yeah the, the 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 two days per week that we have to <laughs> ourselves eliminate those they don't matter uh 20 it's like 25 days or something like that until until spring practice yeah that's uh schedule trickling out from the woody hayes athletic center and last week we began our breakdown of the spring position groups with the quarterbacks of course uh we'll probably do it multiple times moving forward but Moving on on that, if you missed it, go back and check that out from last week. Uh, today we decided the next step would be staying in the offensive backfield and going with the running backs. And there is a lot of talent and still not a lot of, I don't know, clear certainty about how Ohio State will manage it. It's it's an odd position group to analyze at the moment because what it's going to be in the spring I think is very different from what it's going to be when we're really gearing up for the 2023 season. Cause I'm, I'm like Trayvon Henderson just had surgery. I imagine he's not going to be available for spring ball. Um, Evan Pryor is coming off the knee injury in August. And and even if you like map out that timeline and you think to yourself, well, that's enough time for him to get back. Like do you, do you how much do you want him to do in spring ball? Um, Mayan Williams was pretty beat up last year. How much do you want him to do in spring ball? Then all of a sudden you're down to like two healthy running backs who can do anything for you in the spring, uh, which also makes me wonder what what Xavier Johnson's role might be uh, at mm. this time of year and if it might be different from from a, a few months from now when, when running back is a little more settled. But uh, even in, in addition to that, you have two guys or three guys that you know can play, uh, a fourth guy who has not had a shot yet who really wants to play, and a fifth guy in Trip Trainum, uh, who was a decent <laughs> running back at Arizona State, and is and is seemingly kind of settled on playing running back now at Ohio State after he came here to play linebacker. And I don't know what you do with <laughs> with all that. I know we ask that question of Tony Alford every offseason, and he always makes fun of us for doing so. But but this is like the most extreme example I think that we've had of of what are you going to do with all these guys? Yeah, this is different than just trying to figure out Travion and Mayan or J.K. and Mike Weber, like. This is now because TC Caffey, I think they believe highly enough yeah. in him that you could put him in that conversation. He's also uh, coming off of injury. As you said, you put Xavier Johnson in that bucket as well. Like now you're talking about getting to seven guys at running back, all of whom have shown they can play and contribute at a high level for Ohio State. I think at some point the chip train him part, he was pretty adamant. He so what we told him before the Peach Bowl, he had an, he came to the offensive uh, media day and replaced Mayan when Mayan was sick. And it was like, well, I don't know where I'd like to play. I feel at home at running back. I like it there. And like, well, uh, Ryan Day said last week that it would be your choice what you wanted to do. And he was like, oh, well, running back. Cool. <laughs> I don't know that that's the best choice for Chip Trainum because of this log jam. I thought he was really doing some positive things at linebacker. Now that picture is not even as clear on defense, so um, he may have his work cut out of for him either way just to get on the field for Ohio State next year. He's certainly athletic and tough enough to do either one, um, but I, I, don't know, I don't know how you factor that into that a fully healthy backfield, which Ohio State really didn't have last year, how mm -hmm. Chip Trainum can get into that mix outside of just playing a lot in spring and and – changing minds perhaps I, I don't, it doesn't to me i think he's better suited on linebacker but if it's where he wants to be that's where he wants to be i you make a good point there about the spring and the opportunity that that i i imagine he would have if he if he does stay at running back he and dallin hayden i, I would imagine and are going to get a whole lot of carries in, in the spring um so they're going to get a nice long look at both of those guys to see what kind of improvements they've made um Chip is in a weird spot because, like, I honestly, what it might come down to is maybe which position needs him more kind of after the roster settles out at the conclusion of spring practice. And I'm, I'm not predicting that they're going to lose guys from either running back or linebacker, but it's also the nature of college football that that you don't know what's going to come. And there's, 
guys in both position groups who have not played a ton who I'm sure want to. So we'll have to see how that settles and then where, where that leaves Ohio State from a number standpoint at, at, at those respective positions because Chip, I think, can help them at either one. Um, it's it's a it's a nice luxury, I think, for Ohio State to have, and somehow they have like multiple guys who can play offense or defense depending <laughs> on, on what they need. So that's great. But you also um, – I don't know if you worry, but but you want you want the best for the player too, and we have seen players in the past get caught a little bit in between. I hope that doesn't happen for a guy like Chip, who who's already transferred once, um, and just looking for the right fit and a place to be productive. But no matter which side of the ball it's on, I think he can help them. Yeah, and I'm thinking back uh, to last year where Cade Stover really wanted to play on defense and really wanted to be at linebacker, and I believe it was practice number six of spring. It's like, well, there he is, right back at tight end. The opportunity was greater, the potential, the need, all of that stuff uh, forced him, essentially. He, you, know, you can't really force Cade Stover to do anything he doesn't want to do, but uh, everybody was pushing it that sort of direction, and then Cade Stover went along with that and had a great season at tight end. Um, I am i don't think, whether it's linebacker or running back, that Chip Trainum is going to be a starter uh, and a captain the way that Cade Stover was, but... He, the flexibility exists where we may see him start. He may he maybe even spend seven practices in spring at running back and seven at linebacker or eight at linebacker. I don't know. He he does provide a bunch of versatility and that's valuable. Um, but that's that's going to be lower down there on the depth chart. That doesn't make sense for us to spend the entirety of this uh, episode mm. talking about Chip Trainum. Um, Mayan healthy Mayan. I think we know what he provides Ohio State. I think there's a lot more intrigue with what year two looks like for Dallin Hayden. Uh, we heard so much about ball security throughout the year and Ryan day kind of, I think you asked him about that. <laughs> like, does he, does he fumble in practice or like <laughs> maybe more subtly than that? Like, why is he not out there? And he just said, Oh, you know, that's what we say for freshmen. Something must've been happening on the practice field more so than he wanted to let on publicly. The answers were certainly leading in that direction. So what does this spring look like for him? Does he take, does he make the improvements that they're looking for? And then how high is he able to climb into that rotation? Based on what we saw in November of last year, you you know that he can play uh, at a high level in the Big Ten. I think I asked, um, is there something that we don't see uh, <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis that it, that impacted uh, his limited usage in the Michigan game or something like that? And Ryan Day said, like, no. But uh, And he, he used more words to say no. Uh, I think I think ultimately what that came down to was just not wanting to put a true freshman in that spot, and then frankly, I I think maybe they they questioned themselves after the fact because then Dallin played quite a bit against Georgia on arguably a, a bigger stage against the better defense, or not arguably a bigger stage. It was a bigger stage against a, against a better defense, um, mm -hmm. and he played okay. Like it wasn't it wasn't his his best game of the year, but he played he played already showed some promise. Avery Johnson showed showed some promise in that game as well as as, as a receiver and a running back. So. Um, you have guys there that you know can be playmakers. Dallin, um, I think probably I would imagine they'd like to see him get a little bigger. I think maybe he was like in the 190, maybe even a little bit lower than that range last year. And if you look at him, he was sort of like more sinewy than I think maybe a, a running back typically is, especially compared to a guy like Mayan Williams, who's just like a, a little ball of muscle running around out there. <laughs> um, so, so I think that'll probably be a major talking point for Dallin this year. But he's got the skill. Um, I, I don't think you need to be um you know you don't i don't think you have to bring it like a whole lot to the table to to be a successful running back in this system and by and by that i mean i think they would prefer for you to keep your game fairly simple and dallin does that he's like a one cut guy he's downhill he falls forward which is a, a pretty strong character trait i think for a guy to have especially a guy who's who's a little bit on the slighter side for a running back so he he has worked his way into this conversation which i was not anticipating i figured we get to this point this year and if Mayan did come back, it'd be like, oh, Mayan and Trey, how do you figure that out? What's Evan Breyer's role going to be? And all of a sudden, there's this fourth guy now who we know can, if he were the number one guy, I think could be pretty productive, which is good for Ohio State to have that depth, uh, but also I think complicates the situation just a little bit more for Tony Alford. Yeah, I think what was so tough to figure in November, especially you know for the game and how little Dallin Hayden played against Michigan, was that it's not like the Maryland game was close and it may have been by default that he had to be out there because Travion's foot was not letting him go. Mayan had the high ankle sprain, wasn't available. Chip Trainum was working through injuries. Like they really had uh, nobody else at that point, but the game was on the line and they were feeding him over and over and over again, 
I know that there's a difference between Maryland, Michigan, and Georgia, but we saw those two second halves sort of back to back, Indiana and Maryland, and those were pretty. Those were proving grounds. They're conference games. Yes, Ohio State should have was widely favored to win both of them, but they had to give him the football. He performed. He didn't fumble. He didn't have ball security in any game where he went in, and then it just sort of disappeared. I don't know. That's still a better freshman season and a more productive one than I imagined that he would have or that would ever be necessary. And again, injuries forced Ohio State's hand in some respect there, but you know now that he's done it in games that matter. He's Mm going to get better with another full spring. He's got winter workouts, spring, summer, all the normal things ahead of him. And it's going to be the the opportunity. What is it going to be? I don't know, but he made the choice to be patient to come back for this year, which does bode well because you know that that's potentially setting up for him to be the guy in 2024. That's skipping way ahead of things. But, you know, if he was purely looking to go jump somewhere and get carries, he could have done so easily this offseason. And the fact that he hasn't, again, as you said, is another major bonus for Ohio State because, like, that's sort of the turning point decision after year one. Like, if you're in for year two, Probably means you're setting that up for year three. We'll see. I, I, yeah, I would think so because um, he know he knows the deal. He knows that that obviously the Meyer and Trey are coming back and the workload that those guys got with within the offense. Um, I, I'd imagine it's probably not the correct time to have this conversation now because it's not they don't have their full complement available and they're not playing games yet. But we're going to get to a point I think that we were in this past season where you ask yourself what's the balance between. Wanting to get all these guys touches, wanting to make sure running backs get into a rhythm, wanting to make sure you avoid the 2018 scenario that you were talking about last year. Um, I, like, like I still feel like a guy, especially a guy like Travion, um, can benefit from the less wear and tear if he can manage to stay healthy throughout the course of a season. Then you can give him between 10 to 12 carries instead of between 15 and 20 carries a game week to week. A guy like Dallin Hayden helps you do that. So. Um, I don't think it's easy to convince running backs who know that they're good and know that they can be 25 carry a, a game guys that they're okay in a system that might only give them eight to 12 a game. But uh, I think Tony Alford is pretty good at managing those egos and, and and pushing the right buttons to get guys in that proper frame of mind. And, and if Ohio State can get there, if they can get to August and know that they're going to have Maya and Travion and Dallin, and then who knows what you might get from Evan Pryor because he's really talented too. Like we, we sort of always forget about him in this conversation. I'm sure we'll talk about him more. But even if you have this those three, um, I, I I can't imagine there are many teams across the country who would be better situated at that position if you can get those three to that point and not have them understand their roles in a way that is uh, helpful for the offense moving forward. Yeah, Tony Alford has done a great job managing that throughout his career. Um, you know, sometimes it works better than others with the guys. But I think back to going on the road right before COVID struck or the last like recruiting trip that Berm and I were doing. And I was swinging through Virginia to meet Travion Henderson and then heading down to North Carolina when Evan Pryor was getting ready to commit and how much that those guys were on board with the idea of coming in together and sharing the load to limit the wear and tear with thinking about NFL contracts and getting to a second NFL contract way down the road, that forward vision. So some of this, if it's player led and the, brotherhood of that unit with which seems pretty good between Mayan and Trey especially Mm -hmm. Uh, and if Dallin is in on that and saying well maybe this does make more sense that I don't have to take 350 carries three years in a row and then hope to stay healthy getting to the NFL like maybe maybe some of that message has been absorbed in his in his player led and unit driven and allowing them to succeed Uh, we'll see Um, but Evan Pryor's not come even close to the amount of carries that he would have envisioned through two years. And we were all, we were both really excited to see him in sort of that Curtis Samuel role. And there was a lot of off season and a lot of optimism about the spring he had. And then that sort of fizzled out quickly in August and Xavier Johnson can do some of the similar things, but I don't I was, know. Yeah. I was going to say, should we call it the Xavier Johnson role? <laughs> yeah. The Xavier Johnson <laughs> position. Like I think that's going to, that's another wrinkle to it. And I don't know whether we need to talk to about him more today or when we do wide receivers, he's got more that stuff out of the backfield. I really like it. Mm -hmm. We saw that that with Jackson in the Rose bowl and then some against Michigan state with Xavier and obviously against Georgia. I think Evan Pryor can do some of those things. I envision more of like the jet sweep and pop pass stuff with him and, and more of 
Curtis Samuel or Paris Campbell type stuff. But, you know, that's that's sort of the differentiator, trying to figure out how many touches are necessary and not trying to get into a 50-50 split in the backfield, but also, you know, how many are you going to borrow from the wide receivers if you're going to do some of this different stuff to get to the perimeter? Like, I, it's a probably got to be a fun conversation for the coaching staff to have. Um, but you still have to get Evan Pryor back from that knee injury, which is pretty significant. And I don't know how much he's going to be taking part in March and April. I would imagine, I'd imagine he'll be out there because we'll be what seven, eight months removed from it by that point. And that's typically the timeline for it was an ACL, right? For an ACL yep. injury. Um, but even then, I still think you want to be cautious. I think there have been guys in the past that have had that injury at the, at a similar time, sort of been walking through the beginning of spring practice, and then by the end of spring practice, they were doing stuff, but they, they didn't play in the spring game for obvious reasons. So maybe maybe that's kind of the, the path that, that Evan Pryor is on. Um, I do think he can do all those things you were talking about. And I also wonder, too, as we talk about all these running backs, and, and this is not a receiver conversation today, but clearly they have a lot at that position, too. They have tight ends as well that can be playmakers in this offense. They're going to have a brand-new quarterback, too. So, And I, I, I think while it may be difficult to figure out how to feed all those mouths, um, it, it could be exactly what you need in a year where you're trying to bring a, a new quarterback along. Um, not slowly, because you open up with a Big Ten game on the road and you play Notre Dame in the fourth week of the season, but um, in, in a way that doesn't put everything on the quarterback's shoulders. And, and I think you can get a little creative with the different skill sets they have in this backfield with what they have in the receiver room to make it so that whether it's Kyle McCord or Devin Brown, they're not in a position where they have to throw the ball 45 times for a high seat to feel like it has a chance to win the game. What do you what do you make of this offseason for Travion? He's, he came in for a huge amount of social media sort of criticism. Uh, you and I have both pointed out, I think, fairly – the inconsistency in his game while also making note that the injuries were more severe than Ohio state was publicly letting on. I think that's very important context to add to it. I think even when he was healthy, he wasn't playing to his max potential. Um, but we've seen him posting a lot of stuff, motivational motivation wise coming back to prove people wrong, but then also like locking his account to not let some of that mm -hmm. negative feedback come back at him. So I wonder what his, I guess I think, March and April, probably going to be limited physically. I wonder more about the the mental headspace for Travion and and how he'll respond to all of that because this is a, a pretty big season, big offseason, and a big year for him if he's just got eyes on going to the NFL draft next spring, which we all know was his original plan. Yeah. Um, for one, I, I uh, applaud locking the replies. I think, that, <laughs> I think, that's, I think that's healthy uh, for someone who comes under as much scrutiny as, as a player like Travion does. Uh, that is unnecessary noise that you don't need to be subjecting yourself to willingly. So if you can, if you can erase that a little <laughs> bit, uh, I'm, I'm all for it. I, I certainly understand that. Um, I do think it probably is more, more mental. I, I, obviously, it's, it's physical. Like he's got to, he's got to get healthy. But the thing with Travion, like he was so good as a true freshman after like having not played football at all for a year. So I don't really worry about him, his ability to be productive next year if he were to take a extended period off that was solely focused on him getting physically healthy um, and being like the most healthy he can be when when that opener against Indiana rolls around. Uh, so if that means he's like limited, whatever that means throughout the spring and summer and even sometimes in fall camp, that's fine because I, I think once he hits the ground, he'll do so. He'll hit the ground running and he'll, and he'll be fine. Um, I think it's it's managing – the frustration sometimes that can come with playing the position. Like I don't the, like back to the conversation about sharing the workload. I've never gotten the sense from this particular group of players that that's been difficult for them. But I do think there are times when Travion is on the field and you can clearly see he's frustrated, whether that's, I don't, I don't think it's in lack of touches. Um, I think maybe it's in, at times like not making the most of what he gets and, and probably being frustrated with his own injuries too. And I think part of that is that he was such a dynamic high school player that things probably came pretty easy to him when he was at that level. And this is obviously just a very different level of football. And he's got the talent to, to be a star at this level. I think that's apparent. But uh, I think he maybe needs to manage like the down-to-down -down aspect of that a little more. That if, like, if one play doesn't go the way you envisioned it, don't let that carry over to the next play. Just like get back up, get back in the backfield, take your snap, and do, do whatever's required of you and get the three, four, or five yards you need to on that play. Don't try, don't try to hit a home run on the next one because you thought you were going to do so on the previous play and you couldn't do it. So... Um, I think that speaks to the, the mental side of things a little bit, but from like the physical talent, as long as he's healthy, I think he's, he's one of the best running backs in the country. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And that's a, it's one thing to be on board. Like, 
I'm going to get 10 carries and mine's going to get 10 and, you know, whoever else like accepting that, but they all seem to still want to run for 150 yards, no matter mm-hmm. how many carries they get. And so that's what the stuff where we've seen them run into issues is trying to trying too hard to maximize what workload you get. And that's gotten Ohio state off schedule out of sorts. Um, you know, and we, we've definitely seen that bogged down for them at times. So but that's the tricky part that Tony Alford has to continue to manage. Like, he's going to have talented running backs as long as he's the running backs coach at Ohio State. Like For as much uh, scrutiny and hand-wringing as there tends to be about his recruiting success, look at this room. Like I don't know what more yeah. you could possibly ask from it heading into the spring camp. Yeah, you'd want it to be a little bit healthier, but they're trying to juggle, as we said, potentially seven guys that could play in the Ohio State backfield they're not hurting there. Like Tony Alford has still done a good job with his position group, even now that there's been two classes where one he he took a couple swings and it didn't work out, and they wound up with Mayan Williams, and then they got nothing in this most recent class. But once they got to signing day, it was kind of like, all right, well, what would you do if you had another one? Like that would, that would be uh, an even bigger chore because you're probably going to have somebody go out the door in that case. So, yeah. He's got a he got a bona fide star in Travion, um, and a really good second back in that class with Evan Pryor. And like the the two guys recently that he's landed that were sort of like afterthoughts turned out to be pretty good too. So <laughs> like Dalton Dallin Hayden and Mayan Williams. So um, the room from a from a pure talent standpoint, I think the room is in a really good position. Um, it's just a matter of 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 the health and and can they get to August and then can they get through a season with their their top guys uh, ready to contribute on a week-in and week-out basis because obviously that wasn't the case last year. Yep. Don't know how much we'll actually learn about that in March and April because running back is a little bit fickle and also the guys at the top probably going to be limited a bit. But uh, And also once you get to, what is it, April 15th for the spring game, they're mm-hmm. not going to run the ball anyway. They're just going to be throwing <laughs> they sure aren't. Yeah. going to be <laughs> chucking it all over the yard. So uh, I guess that's why it's a good thing we got some of the running backs out of the way early because we're probably not going to learn a tremendous about, amount about them until uh, August. But it's fun to talk about the possibilities anyway uh, as Ohio State gets ready for spring camp with a position preview here on the podcast daily for Tuesday, January 31st. That is Bill. I am Austin. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you later.